Welcome back to the Neuroscience Meet Social and Emotional Learning Podcast, episode number 95. With learning, mood, behavior, author, educator, and speaker, Dr. Sandy Gluckman. Dr. Sandy Gluckman describes her quest as saving the next generation from a growing explosion of learning, behavior, and mood problems. Her work is rooted in the science that shows that children will thrive when parents thrive. Dr. Sandy empowers parents to raise healthy, resilient, confident children primed for success by showing them how to heal themselves. She's sought after for her expertise on a range of children's challenges, such as anxiety, defiance, emotional resilience, self-worth, screen addiction, stress as a survival mechanism, and the sensitive child. Welcome, Dr. Gluckman. Thank you so much for being available to speak with me today. Thank you, Andrea. I am so excited to be with you. Thank you. Well, I've got to say, Dr. Gluckman, when I was reading your book, Parents Take Charge, and I saw the acknowledgments, I saw how perfectly you fit into the content that we've been focused on for the past year and a half, especially with the recent jump that focuses on health and mental well-being. So if we're not physically healthy ourselves, how on the earth can we expect ourselves to perform at high levels? And then how can we expect it of our children, right? Absolutely. They go hand in hand. And it's so interesting, really, if you think about it, Andrea, how did we not realize this before? Right. We kind of thought, you know, um, okay, I fell in love, I got married, and I fell pregnant, and now I'm a mommy and a daddy. And um, that's enough. That's good. I'll do my very best, which all parents do. They do the very best they know how at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. Um, But I don't think that until more recently, we connected the dots, which for me is uh, expressed in a very simple sentence. And that is, what's going on inside of the parent is going on inside of the child. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then of course we have Dr. Siegel who discovered interpersonal neurobiology and with his, all his research has actually confirmed that we are constantly changing the child's neurobiology every, every time we are with them, every look on our face, the tone of our voice, the words we choose, Um, is changing, shaping the child's brain, changing their uh, neurotransmitters. And we, it's just such an important learning to be real, to realize that I can actually shape the child's brain and emotional resilience Mm -hmm. through the way in which I interact with my child. Well, that's eye-opening. It really is. And it's kind of crazy because it was a year ago that I had Dan Siegel on the podcast this week. Like this week, it showed up in in my memories on Facebook. I thought, wow, it was a year ago that I had him on. So now here you put him in your acknowledgments as well as you also were inspired by Dr. Daniel Amen, who inspired us over here to go get our brain scanned and see what we can learn about improving our health. And we interviewed his daughter, um, Chloe, on change your brain, change your grades. And then you also mentioned you've been inspired by Stephen Porges and his polyvagal theory. We've you know, had someone on that, that dove deep into that. And then we've had this recent turn towards the health and well-being of ourselves. And you mentioned Dr. Mark Hyman, and I was inspired to go this route when I watched his Alzheimer's, the Science of Prevention series that really focuses on a lot that I was learning from the brain scan, how important sleep is, the importance of our nutrition, um, intermittent fasting, our microbiome, and it just took us on a different direction Uh, for well-being for ourselves to put health first and so you know when I when I saw some of the things that you were talking about I thought you are our perfect match for where we are right now in the podcast so this this is exciting to dive deep 
And actually, when I looked at your podcast, I thought to myself, I've got to find a way to get hold of Andrea. Oh, because it does seem up. like we were meant to talk to each other. Definitely, definitely. I, I got so excited. And then let me just take you back, though, because my career began as a teacher in Toronto and I had behavioral students. And I've, I've said it a lot on some of these podcasts. I had no strategies for managing my own stress, had no idea how to manage these students. You know, we, we had workshops that we went to to try to manage our, our students, but there was nothing solid like what we now know. And I've had Dr. Lori Desitel on. She talks a lot about managing our own emotions. And I thought, if only I knew that, maybe I'd still be in the classroom. Who knows? But so I went on this quest to figure this out. And so can you take me back to the beginning of your professional career when you were in uh, South Africa and you started to wonder why some students have a robust, healthy and feisty spirit and why others didn't? What, where did your career begin? Yes, well, I started off as a teacher as well. It seems like another lifetime. Um, uh, but I love teaching. Uh, it's, it's in my blood. Mm -hmm. um, and so what would happen is I was teaching the matric students. So that's the last year of school. And um, I noticed that there would be students who would stay behind during recess or after school and, and wanted to, wanting to chat with me. Um, perhaps if they kind of felt that I would listen to them. So they stayed behind and I began to notice that of all the students who, who did this, there was a sort of pattern and these were children who were the most uh, wonderful kids. They were smart. Um, they were just gentle and sensitive children. And yet they all seemed to find life very stressful. They all seemed to um, struggle um, inside of themselves, not feeling good in their own skin and doubting their own self-worth mm -hmm. and that's where I started to think about well why are these children doing this and then I look out of my classroom and I see other children who are robust and resilient and they're just getting on with life and they're not feeling so vulnerable and stressed by life and that's really what got me going and um, I went off to study got the PhD in psychology and then I uh, opened a practice and I began to see, once again, that every single one of these people who came to see me of all ages had the same kind of um, thing going on inside of them, which I describe as having a hurting spirit. Mm -hmm. It's like an ache inside um, where I just feel, you know, when I'm talking about spirit, I'm not talking about spirituality or, or religion. I'm talking about the, the energetic Mm -hmm. vibration of who I am and it felt like all of these people were just hurting on the inside and so again I, I was watching this for a long time I did lots of research and I discovered that the reason why because I kept asking myself I'm always about the underlying root cause all the time I want to know what's underneath it what's underneath it Mm -hmm. And um, my research kept showing over and over again that these people, whether they were um, toddlers, teens or adults, they all had the same thing going on inside of them. And that is that they had a core belief, which, of course, lives in a neural pathway, mm -hmm. that they're not good enough. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, that belief of not being good enough, I know it. I know it so well. Me too. I had it. I know. It was, it's amazing. And I just wanted to be able to do whatever I could to help others not feel that way because it's incredibly painful. Mm -hmm. Always just not feeling like, am I going to meet somebody's expectations? Am I good enough for this? Can I take the risk? No, I can't take the risk. What if I fail? Um, it's, it's very exhausting, but also, what's so important is that that I'm not good enough, I'm not enough belief, um, it creates a lot of inner stress. 
So by that, I mean I'm really talking physiologically and neurologically about um, an overload of stress hormones. And because every time we default into that belief of, oh, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough, um, we are raising those stress hormones. Cortisol is being secreted. And every time we do that, our brain becomes inflamed. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, with the inflamed brain, it affects our behavior and it also throws the neurotransmitters out of balance. So we're going to get things like depression and anxiety and and what's being called ADHD and ODD and all these things. But essentially what really, really uh, got to me was the discovery that all these diagnoses that kids are being given and teens and adults, (laughs) all the diagnoses at the root is this feeling of I'm not good enough. I'm not enough, which then throws the, um, neurochemistry off balance through the stress that it creates internally. And everyone's different, right? So we don't really know why each person has that. It could be someone gave them feedback um, on a sports team, maybe like I I can go back to my high school days where uh, I tried out for the basketball team and I was told, no, you'd be a better runner. And I thought, oh, geez, I don't don't want to run. I want to be on the basketball team. But for some reason, that coach didn't want me to play and deflected me somewhere else. And and I thought, well, I'm not good enough for basketball. And I ended up getting my all my coaching certification just to prove I'm just fine at basketball. But uh, you don't know where that came from in that in that child. It could be from home, school. So why would someone, one child be resilient to that and another would take it inside and then maybe never try out for sports again? That's a great question. Um, you know, there are some children who, well, they, let me put it this way. Um, there are two kinds of, of babies that pop into the world. There's the one who pops out and comes into the world and goes, hello world, here I am just bring it on. I'll go with the flow. I'll make it happen. And then there there are others who come into the world and they're very much more cautious, very sensitive by nature and um, very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And the difference actually is, and I always don't enjoy talking about this because I don't want anyone who's listening ever to blame themselves. But the truth of the matter is that it started in the fetus. Mm -hmm. It started with a, a, a um, situation where the pregnant mom may have had some stress. Okay, I believe that. Being... So it could be all kinds of stress. You know, God forbid they may have lost a loved one or they were having stress with, with their spouse or um, work stress or just maybe it's an anxious mom. And the stress hormones would then be, um, up, uh, the fetus would then pick up the stress hormones And these children then come into the world already Mm. wired for stress. Got it. Makes sense. So they are much more vulnerable and less emotionally robust. There's good news, of course, and that is that that can be changed, but it's very up to the parents to understand, I've got a very wonderful, sensitive little girl or little boy And that's not bad news. It's wonderful news because it's going to be that child's gift one day, Mm -hmm. but it will be a burden if the child doesn't know how to deal with it. And therefore me as the mommy, I need to understand how do I raise this sensitive child so that the, the child becomes emotionally robust, but from the inside, Mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to do it from the outside in. In other words, how do I create the kind of chemistry Mm -hmm. in the child's brain that then translates into resilience? Got it. Because otherwise, without this skill, this child will miss out on many incredible life opportunities because they don't want to try or put themselves out into the world, right? There's Yes, absolutely. And forever, life, I mean, I'm speaking from experience. It's why I do what I do. Forever, life is harder. 
you know, when you, when you just don't have that inner sense of self-worth and the emotional resilience that comes with it. I think that parents very often think, you know, I, I'll tell you that pretty much every single parent who visits with me in the early first visit, they will tell me, Dr. Sandy, I want you to please help me to see how I can get my child to be more emotionally resilient. Mm. And I think there's a misunderstanding about resilience. Resilience is actually a neurochemistry. It's, mm. it's kind, of like, kind of like a chemical con, uh, 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 um, drink, a cocktail. I was looking for yeah. the word. It's like a chemical cocktail of, let's say, um, of um, serotonin and endorphins and dopamine and oxytocin. And you put that together and it's all secreting at the right level and you get emotional resilience. But how do we get that chemical cocktail to be secreted? And that lies in the energy of the parent-child relationship. Got it. There's a lot of work to be done. This is not just as straightforward as we think. This is a lot of thinking on the parent's point of view, taking things slowly. That's why all these speakers that you talked about, Dan Siegel, um, Dr. Ave, there's lots of different components that all come into play at the brain level, at the parenting level. And then sometimes we're going to mess it up. And it's going to be okay because we can repair and say, you know, that's, I didn't mean to do it that way. Let's replay and they're still going to be okay. You know, there's a lot to think about from, from a parent point of view. Oh, yes, there is. But you know, it's not as difficult as it sounds. I think that um, my experience with parents is that once they understand that they actually have the power to rewire Mm -hmm. the child's self-belief, and start a new neural pathway, and then they get the tools from me on how to do that. They fun, they easy to apply. It's right. just kind of uh, one hundred and one. Really, is how do I validate my child in such an authentic kind of way that in this validation I am shifting the child's um, chemistry Got it. towards resilience. Yeah, makes sense. So in your book, in the very beginning, Parents Take Charge, you introduce a new way of healing children's learning, behavior, and mood problems. And you actually talk about this 11-year-old named David, and he was having some challenges with learning at school, and he was diagnosed with a bunch of different disorders like ADHD, depression, and then was given a ton of medicine to go along with each diagnosis. Can you share how the mom got to the root of the problem and how she found out that it was health related and he just needed a change in diet and some supplements and then all his symptoms were gone. What, what happened with this young boy? Yes. So I do want to um, maybe kind of um, adjust a little what you just said Sure. and that it is, was not all health related. Uh, I discovered there was a health component which often got left out. And what happens with these children is that then they will be diagnosed with some kind of diagnosis. So we've got massive ADHD, the largest disorder in the world. And we've got this thing called ODD, which is such rubbish. And there's no child who's got a, a defiance disorder. It's a, it's a stress-related condition. Um, and then there is OCD and um, depression and anxiety and all these things that are happening to these children. And the, uh, the thing that parents tend to do, again, with the best intentions in the world, is get the diagnosis, sometimes the medication, pretty often, but sometimes not, and then um, off to the therapist. Mm-hmm. But the truth of the matter is, that we can't change the child. We can't fix the child until something changes inside of the parent. Mm -hmm. So the one component of David's um, amazing success of just getting rid of all of his symptoms and diagnoses, the one component is that the parents began to relate to David differently. They began to engage with him differently, interact with him differently, they had understood that they were what I refer to as inflammatory parents. Mm. 
they were inflaming David and causing more and more stress hormones, more and more brain inflammation unintentionally. So there's that piece. And then the other piece, which is so amazing, and that is that piece of what we call other integrative medicine or um, functional medicine, where we understand that there is no symptom that happens in isolation. Every single thing is connected. And so with uh, David, what we discovered is that, you know, he had some um, vitamin and mineral deficiencies. He had some food um, allergies. There was, uh, I think there was even some um, heavy metal toxicity levels. And once we adjusted that and we changed his diet, and mom and dad were interacting with him differently, which is a kind of a diet because yeah. it's a yeah. chemistry diet. Mm-hmm. The, the David just flourished in, in ways you cannot even imagine. So it is that combination. That's powerful. And I can see how, you know, even with all these podcasts, all this training, all this knowledge, I bet you I'm still coming across as anti-inflammatory without even knowing it, you know, just the, there's always room for improvement. It's no one's perfect at this, right? It's- yes. And, you know, I think that the, um, the one thing that I'd love all your listeners to be aware of, which they probably well know, but I'll quickly run through it. And that is that when we're stressed um, in terms of, of interpersonal neurobiology, we are stressing our children. Mm-hmm. They will have the same level of stress, literally stress hormones in their bodies as mom is, has in hers right now. Um, and then when we're stressed and the brain is inflamed, what we will see is three kinds of behaviors. We will see fight, flight, or freeze mm-hmm. because of the inflammation in the brain and because of the fact that you know the child is, is now operating from the lower brain. Right. So yeah. children who are in stress-related fight mode Look what happens to them. They being given this diagnosis of ODD, oppositional defiance disorder. Now they have a diagnosis which follows them around. Um, They believe they're not good enough. There's something wrong with me. There's something I'm not good. I'm not okay. I've got ODD. And their stress levels continue to rise. And then they go to the therapist and Traditional therapy does not work because of the stress level. You can't get through to a child who's got high level of stress and inflammation in the brain. It's difficult to really make some change there. And so what's happening is these children are really being stuck um, with the best intentions in the world, but they are the victims of, um, of, of stress that's not understood well by parents and um, and um, practitioners and teachers, teachers. Right. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Teachers have got such a huge job. And I, I, I was a teacher, so I know. But there's not enough training for teachers to understand that a stressed brain cannot learn. I think it's just coming out. Uh, I know there was... Um, Kimberly Schoenert-Reichel out of University of British Columbia was the first I heard about a study she did where she studied the students in the classroom and when the teacher was stressed, their cortisol raised. Um, And it was like a cycle. It was like, you know, you're you're stressed as a teacher, then the behavior goes all down the drain. And then you're, of course, you're stressed again because you're yelling at someone to go to the office and it's just never ending. So it just reminded me of back when I was teaching just how I was looking for a solution and now I see the solution. I, I understand it starts with me. It, you know, as, uh, I was always looking for, well, you know, they need to do this. No, it started with me. And that was such a huge realization, I think, to learn some strategies to like self-regulate. Yes. And so you just triggered for me that I didn't really answer your last question because um, what we need to really ask ourselves is what's my stress related style of behavior mm-hmm. as a mommy? Am I a, I'm a, do I go into fight mode? 
I'm now one of those people who get angry. I yell, I get frustrated, and I raise my voice. Um, my body language changes. I get, you know, it's, it's visible that I'm really mad. Or am I one of those mummies that go into flight mode, which means I, I get quiet, I go inwards, I withdraw, I feel overwhelmed, I don't know what to do, I feel helpless, uh, or maybe even in uh, freeze mode. So again, because we now have such wonderful evidence that um, what's going on inside of the mom will go on inside of the child, and we also have the mirror neurons. So if a mom is in fight mode, let's say, that child has only one of three options available to that to, to respond to mom with, and that is fight, flight, or freeze. So we, we push them into that stress-related behavior, and then we say, oh, my child's depressed and withdrawn. Well, no, the child's in stress-related flight mode, gone inwards. When mom stops being in stress mode, the child emerges. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think that it's important for us to ask the question, and I have a whole bunch of videos of these on YouTube about this particular topic. Ask and answer the question of what is my stress-related style? And then you will understand what it is you need to change because it is that that is triggering mm -hmm. the behavior we don't want in our children. Absolutely. I remember when I started meditating, I noticed that's when my children's behavior improved. Fantastic. Is, isn't it wild that like I can pinpoint, you know, when they're little, they're running around and they're crazy and, and like everything is crazy. And then I remember learning meditation. I, I thought, you know, I've got to do something. And I was studying with John Asraf and I got a lot of his programs. And so that's where, where it began. And I just found it really challenging to sit for half an hour with young children around. But then the benefits, now, it, I didn't see it right away. It was, you know, I was just learning with John Asraf. I got this program, might as well do it. Told the children, hey, mommy's learning meditation. Just leave me for this like half hour while I do this. And then it became a routine. They, they knew that's what mommy does. They, you know, made fun of me for the first little bit, but then, then they started learning themselves these strategies. And then that's when we had a calmness in the house. And I've tried all sorts of strategies like music. I've always got uh, music playing like spa music, regular times when Christmas comes around, I'll put the Christmas music on anything to try to make the house calm but just different calming strategies that right. essential oils being wafting in the air is also useful but there is nothing andrea i'm so excited to know that you meditate because there is no more powerful tool than meditation for us for us as individuals for ourselves and also for our parenting and our children benefit immensely when we meditate so yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's fabulous. Oh, that was like, that was, it started with John Asraf. And then of course, uh, Dan Siegel's will of awareness is pretty powerful. And, um, and, and the benefits that it, it, they're obvious. It's, you know, it, years later, you can pinpoint, oh, that's how I used to be before I took the time to just go within. And then it's so worth it. You're right. Mm -hmm. So let's just go back to children with mood problems. So because I've, I've started noticing my girls, they're 11 and nine, and I'm starting to notice the eye rolling, you know, the, <laughs> yeah. uh, when I ask them to do something and, and, you know, what, and then I think back to when I was teaching my students in the classroom with clear behavioral problems, you know, I would turn around and write something on the board and then things would be flying behind my back. So what, what do we even start with behavior like this, mild eye, eye rolling to, you know, I don't believe a thing you're saying, to we've got to control a classroom of students? Yeah, that's such a good question. Because the truth is, um, I, we have to have boundaries. It's impossible not to have boundaries. It's how we establish those boundaries that becomes very important. Our expectations 
in my home, we don't do this, and so on. It's the tone of voice, it's the language we use that can be either inflammatory or non-inflammatory. Mm. So um, when, when we get the eye rolling and all of that kind of stuff, we really, it's a message to us. Mm. You know, I, I believe that children don't often have the language to tell us what it is they think we ought to know. <laughs> And so it comes out in funny ways. It either comes out in physical things, like, you know, like ac uh, uh, acne or asthma or uh, tummy aches and headaches, because those are messages to us as parents that there's something we are doing in our relationship with our child that is not feeling good to them. Wow. So if they're rolling their eyes, really what they're trying to tell us is you're coming across in a way that just doesn't feel <laughs> doesn't feel good to me no. um, and I don't know if you've seen my video or but I am such a believer you know I keep asking myself why are we getting this incredible epidemic such exponentially growing numbers of children with mood and behavior problems coming into the world and and I think that it's because our children actually have come to teach us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's okay. no coincidence for any mom or dad and the children that they have in their home. Wow. They have come to teach us, mom, you know what? There's another way to look at this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, we often don't hear it because we think we have all the answers. So I do think that m m my parents and children are on a, a parallel journey of growth and learning as opposed to I'm the parent, you're the child. I know what's right and what's wrong. And when you do it wrong, I'm going to let you know because we really need to ask ourselves, what can I learn from this eye rolling or what can I learn from this behavior? And the other thing I would say at this point to answer your question, Andrea, is when the children are behaving in ways that are just really inappropriate and or not right, we need to find a way to connect with them mm. because we get so busy redirecting them, mm -hmm. telling them this is not okay, this is what we need, why are you doing that? Uh, we ask them why. Uh, and we use the word you a lot. Why are you doing this? When you do that, I don't like it. It's more a case of us wanting to go um, spirit to spirit. And let me have a little, a little conversation with my daughter's spirit. Mm. And, 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 you know, there are ways we can do that. But the simplest way is to not ask them what they're feeling or, or you know, why they're doing this, because that's already inflammatory, mm. is to um, just put on this very curious, warm, loving, casual voice and say something like, you know what, I get, you, now we're not talking about the behavior at all. Mm -hmm. we re, because remember, you've, I think you've said it, where, where, the, where the attention goes, the energy goes, mm -hmm. and we get more of that. Right. So we're not even discussing the behavior. We are trying to get in here and have a beautiful connected conversation. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a little gentle, casual voice going like, you know what, honey, I don't know if I'm right, I could be wrong, but I kind of get a feeling you're worried about something. Or you could choose the word that you think is appropriate for that situation. I, I kind of get the feeling that you're frustrated. Am I right? Now you're having a completely different conversation. Right, trying to get to the root of the of the rolling and whatever other behaviors you have. And just having someone important like my mom or my teacher have this conversation with me it is a message to my being that i am being seen mm -hmm. for who it is i am and how i'm feeling right now seen right directly into yes wow. yes That's powerful that gives me chills lots to think about here dr gluckman can we talk a little bit about your experience as a teacher and psychologist and leadership coach and 
how you saw the importance of mental, emotional, and social well-being of a student. Like it's it's all in the schools now. Every um, California, especially, they now have social emotional coaches. But it wasn't always this way. So um, you know, now that we've got virtual learning going on in some places, some kids are learning at home. How, how do you see the importance of connecting the social emotional and cognitive side of students with their learning now? Mm. Wow, such a powerful question. And um, I'm, I'm deeply, deeply concerned about what's going on at the moment mm -hmm. because um, the virtual learning and even those of where the children are going to school, but they're, they're, things are different, they can't sit near each other and it's just completely different and they don't understand really what's going on and for many children, or certainly the ones who visit with me and the parents who visit with me in the past few months, they're very, very anxious. They're fearful, very fearful. And so um, there can be no learning going on when a child is anxious and fearful and, and just doesn't understand why, why has my life changed so much? And now I'm sitting in front of a screen and I miss my friends and, um, I think that, and again, I've done a bunch of videos, if anyone wants to watch on my YouTube channel about this, I think that before any teacher or before a parent sits a child down to do any kind of learning in the current situation, they need to do some, something that will calm the child, that will, will calm the child's nervous system, that will get the child to feel safe, maybe even look forward to the learning, uh, but feel good about me, feel good about the situation. Um, and then they can move into to saying, okay, what do we have to do? You know, what kind of tasks do we have to complete today? What assignments do we have to complete? The problem is that um, there's too much emphasis on the doing of a child and not enough on the being. And right now, children's beings are hurting. They're confused. They're worried. So we need to calm their being. And there's some simple ways to do that, really simple ways. Little, um, We could look at a few yoga stretches, three, four yoga stretches for, okay, kids, we're going to start learning. But before we learn, get your yoga mats out and let's do three, four stretches. Obviously, the purpose of the stretch is to calm the vagal nerve and the nervous system. Mm -hmm. Now we can get them into learning. Maybe you combine that with some breathing. What are we talking about? We're talking about four minutes mm -hmm. of some beautiful breathing and teaching them how to breathe correctly in and out um, in ways that does do calm the nervous system. Or, as you suggested, five minutes of meditation. But that should be done before any attempt at asking them to learn something. Mm -hmm. You know, I get carried away, Andrea, and I forgot your question. Have I answered your question? <laughs> yeah, so, so for the students learning from home in the, pandem um, in the pandemic, it's, what I'm hearing a lot of, let's just say everyone's different. Every state is different. I'm sure every country is different with what they're, what they're going through. So we've got some students that might thrive at home because they can just go online and do their work. And then others that are really having a difficult time with the online learning. And then they go back to school and then there's the whole anxiety of now I'm going back to school and whatever they're dealing with. I've heard it so many, wherever I go, there's a problem with either going back to school or staying at home. And this is going to perhaps be flip-flopping back and forth. So what could we be doing as parents or teachers to, to reduce this stress? And yeah, I would say you definitely answered it with the question of doing some yoga. What about students that are, are stressed out coming back to school? You know, what would you suggest? The thing is that what I said about parents doing yoga or a, a breathing exercise, etc., cetera, um, that really also applies to teachers, but we don't really have that control over that situation. So, you know, every teacher is going to handle the situation differently. Um, and that really means, I would think, that 
the way we start the day with a child before we put them in the car to take them to school yeah. could be very important. Yeah, and I noticed that. I noticed that because I had just started doing work with Dan Siegel. Yes. Um, and I was rushing the girls in the car because I don't know how else to get them in the car, you know, mm -hmm. tell them hurry up, hurry up, get in the car and their little legs are scurrying and, and I'm like trying to slam the door as their backpacks are not even in yet. And then I'm going to my desk and I'm writing this lesson on uh, have we stressed out our children before they've even got to the classroom? And I thought, well, I'm, I'm doing a great job over here. And so I had to change some of the things that I was doing with the new knowledge of, of I don't want to stress out my children. I didn't even realize I was doing it until I was looking, oh, well, how am I sending them off to school? So that was a huge eye opener. It is. It's a huge eye. And of course, also not only in terms of the energy, in the house or, or between us in the kitchen or wherever it is before they go to school. But there's also that, what am I feeding them? Yeah. You know, cause a lot, a lot of the foods are pro inflammatory mm -hmm. and um, creating more stress and inflammation in the brain. And then we want them to learn and they can't. Right. right. Or they're in fight, flight and freeze. Yeah. So there's lots to think about and we kind of know intuitively what's the right answer. We know when we're doing something that's not feeling right, whether we're stressing them out and whether we're putting a nice healthy breakfast in front of them or not. It's kind of obvious what the right thing is. It's just do we cave and do what we want them to do? They, they would much prefer have a chocolate croissant some days. Yes. But I know that's not good for their learning. So that's got to be a one, uh, a treat far and few between, right? Yes. And, you know, the question of do we cave is a very pertinent one because um, do we cave on the food? Do we cave on the screens? Yeah. Because they want to play a game and just another hour, another half an hour. No, and, and you know, they're getting really um, attached to their screens, too much screen time. It, we don't cave. We can't cave when we know the right answer. The only reason that we as a mom or dad would cave is that it's easier for us. Yeah. And because we are stressed. Mm -hmm. So the answer is no, we don't cave, but we do not become inflammatory in the way in which we tell them, this is what you're eating for breakfast today. Got it. You know, it, we, if we're telling it to them from a meditative, calm place in our being, where our voice is just soft and gentle and loving, and that look on our face is non-stressed, there's no tension around our eyes and our jaw, we're just coming across that we're feeling whole, and we're non-negotiable on this, with lots of love, then we will get them to actually buy in. It's it really depends so much on how we establish those boundaries. And it all starts with us. Yeah, it sure does. Whether we're a parent, whether we're a teacher, whether we're in the corporate place. You mentioned an example in your book about these emotions in the corporate place. As yes. Well. Yes. Yes. And as you know, for many years, I was in the corporate uh, leadership situation and um, particularly in South Africa, uh, President Mandela had just come out of prison. We all knew, you know, that in the corporate world, things would need to change dramatically. At that time, I was a, a leadership development and change management expert. And so um, I worked with some of the top organizations in the country in attempting to change the corporate um, leadership style away from the, the autocratic style that went with the, the, the climate and culture um, of apartheid and towards a sort of more engaging style and bringing people on board. And it, it's just uh, amazing, as you say, Andrea, it doesn't matter whether you are an employee or you're the leader um, of a company or a teacher or a mom or a dad or a friend or a spouse. Um, at the end of the day, it all starts with us. We will get um, 
depending on the energetic vibration that we send out, that's what we will get back. And so, so many leaders, I wrote a book for leadership, which is called Who's in the Driver's Seat? And it's about, um, uh, are you leading with spirit or leading with ego? And so many of the leaders then in South Africa were just leading from total ego um, and wondering why, why they were not getting buy-in and involvement and productivity and engagement and a happy culture. Well, it's the kind of energy that they were sending out is what they were getting back. And it's the same at home. We are energetically vibrating beings. And our children, especially the sensitive ones, they just pick it up immediately and then their energy changes to match ours. So we just need to learn how to love who we are, go inwards, find that place of calm in the center of our being and just then vibrate with love. I love it. I love it. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Gluckman, for your time today, getting to the root cause of their behavior, what's going on. I highly recommend your books and your online programs. You do have one that you're promoting right now, Raising Confident, Resilient Children, that primes them for success. And I'll put the link in the show notes that people can just click on and go to. They can find you, um, Dr. Gluckman, on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter, and go to drsandygluckman.com. Is there any other final thoughts that you want to say before we say goodbye? Uh, I'd like to say that on my website, the drsandygluckman.com, um, on the homepage, there is a link for you to schedule, for anyone to schedule a um, complimentary session. Yeah. So it's a 30 minute complimentary session. And many people have said that even just that session changed so many things for them because they began to understand um, what, why they were seeing the kind of behaviors that they were seeing with their children in a completely different kind of way. So um, I'd, I'd like to invite, if you'd like, get, click on that, you'll get to a scheduler, find a time and a day where I have a slot available and hopefully I can transform some lives that way. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for everything that you taught us today and for all you're doing for the world. And thank you for all you're doing, Andrea. Beautiful, wonderful work. Thank you.